Linda, darling, it's Fanny. I'm in London to meet Alfred, but not till luncheon. And I want... Fanny, for God's sake, I'm expecting an important call which may come at any moment. Someone may be trying my number this very second. I almost hit anyone else. All right, I'm on my way. Hello, darling. How do you imagine this got here? All the way from Paris in the middle of all this. The Southern Railway people just brought it and I signed for it. As if things arrive from Paris every day. Oh, Fanny, darling, what an extraordinary war. What are you doing in London, darling? I told you on the telephone I've come to meet Alfred. You telephone? I don't remember. How is Alfred? Oh, he's rushing around buying lots of new equipment and seeing people. He thinks he'll be off abroad again almost immediately. What did he say about Dunkirk? He said it was like something out of the boy's own paper. He seems to have had a fascinating time. Little Matt was here yesterday with Bob. Oh, isn't it wonderful to have them back again? If only one knew what had happened to one's French buddies. Oh, poor Linda. No, don't pity me. I've had several months of perfect and unalloyed happiness. And very few people can say that, even after long, long lives. Just off for now, ma'am, if that's all right. I'll be back this evening. Thank you, Mrs Hunt. I can see you're very cosy here. But still, wouldn't it be jollier and less lonely if you were to go down to Alconley? You know, I'm going there with the children as soon as Alfred's off again. I'd like to come. For a visit. Sometime when I know a little more what is happening. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely to have hours and hours and hours in the Hans cupboard. Oh, it's such heaven to be here again. To be with you and Uncle Matthew. With Louisa, I've hardly seen her in years. Well, you can take turn and turn about with the children. Very handy for both of you. It's so nice for them all to be brought up together. It's just like old times. It's so sweet of you to have us all. Oh, the more the merrier. I should like to fill the house. Well, it's better for the rations. <laughs> With little Matt and Bob in the army. Jassy in America and Victor off in the Rems. Matthew and I would be a very dreary old couple here all alone. I'm surprised they didn't try and stick some evacuees on you. No, they did. Then they decided the house was too cold for the lower classes. So they sent us some enormous crates from the Science Museum instead. Matthew thinks there may be some sort of secret weapon which they're hiding here. Stands to reason. They're not going to bother shifting a load of old rubbish down here to town like this. Essential implements of war, I'd say. Sounds as if it were empty. Don't you go tampering, Missy. It's our duty to guard them until they're wanted. Just that. Well, it's obvious why they sent them down here. They knew that this place is, or soon will be, the headquarters of the LDV. Who's that spy? Oh. Got you. LDV? Oh, local defence volunteers, Doc. They're just forming down here your uncle's in command. <laughs> He's as happy as a boy with his first full-size cricket bag. <sighs> Only Josh, after all. He wanted to bring me the news. Our uniforms have just arrived. Soon this company will be equipped to guard this little lot down to the last man. Then the last woman. It's an ill bomb that blows oh, nobody goodness. any good, and this one's blowing you here. <laughs> oh. Oh, let me help with the dance. Yep. Oh, I'll take it. Uh, I'm just at the right time. I need a subaltern to command the new platoon I'm forming for my home guard. Oh, Matthew, I can't be a subaltern again. I mean, I was a captain when I handed in my papers a million years ago. No vacancies for captains. I need an ensign. Exercise will do you good. Oh, Matthew, so relentless. Oh, all that can wait till later. Time for lunch. Oh, good. I'm starving. What is it? Cottage pie? Cottage pie? It's twice cooked meat. Sheer poison. We all have to make sacrifices in wartime. If I'm to be a platoon commander at my age, I must have proper food. You'll have what you're given and like it. Stiffen up, you wreck. Mr. Warbeck, to the cookhouse. Quick, follow. Hello? Are you Flaxman, 0529? 
Hi. Yes, yes. I have a call for you. Hello, hello. Fabrice. Fabrice! Oui. Oh, Fabrice, I've been waiting for you for such a long time. Ah, come see, Gentil. Now then, can I come to your house straight away? Wait. Yes, you can come at once. But don't go for a moment. Go on talking. I want to hear the sound of your voice. Oh, no, no. I have a car outside. I shall be with you in five minutes. There's too much one cannot do at the telephone machine. Hello, right. It's Sunday and Mrs. Hunt isn't here. Mrs. Hunt? My daily woman. Whatever would she have thought? <laughs> About the same as the night porter at the Hotel Montalembert. Why did you come, Fabrice? To join General de Gaulle? Oh, no, I joined him long ago in Bordeaux. My work is in France, but... We have ways of communicating when we want. I must go and see him, of course. He expects me at noon. But actually, I came on a private mission. I came to tell you that I love you. Never said that to me in Paris. No. You always seem so practical. I had said it so often and often. I had been romantic with so many women. But when I felt this to be different, I couldn't bring out all those stale old phrases again. I couldn't. To them. I never said I loved you. I never called you to. Indeed, you often called me Madame. All on purpose. Because from the beginning, I knew this was as real as the others were false. It was like. Recognizing somebody. Oh, there. I can't explain. Don't try. You needn't. I know. And then, when you were gone, I felt I had to tell you. It became an obsession with me to tell you. All these last dreadful weeks, were made more dreadful because I was being prevented from telling you. However did you get here? On the circuit. I have to leave again tomorrow morning, very early. And I may not be back until the war is over. But you'll wait for me, Linda. And nothing matters so much now that you know. I shall never again have to bear the horror of, of being away from you. And you're not knowing what a great, great love I have for you. Oh, Fabrice, I feel, well, I suppose religious people sometimes feel like this. I've been thinking, soon, London may become a dangerous place. Oh, I know, this Sunday afternoon is peaceful, but I do not think these people know what is coming. And what is coming? Soon, there will be thunderbolts out of this blue sky of yours. The worst kind of thunderbolt always falls from a clear sky. Remember.
think that you should go to Mummy and sign the country. Oh, no, it's not as if I've got children with me like Fanny or Louisa. I shall stay here. Suppose you come to London again, suddenly. It is not likely. If I did, I could find you in the country. Not if it's like this visit. There will be no time. I do not think I shall come again until the war is done. Fabrice? Mm -hmm. Do you think we shall ever live together again? <laughs> of course we shall. For years and years and years. Until I'm 90, I have a very faithful nature. You weren't very faithful to Jacqueline. <laughs> You know about Jacqueline, you do? Ah, uh, poor. She was so kind. Kind, elegant, and boring. Oh, mon dieu. How boring she was. Enfin, I was immensely faithful to her, and it lasted five years. It always does with me. Either five days or five years. But as I love you ten times more as the others, that brings it to when I'm 90, and by then, I shall have got into the habit. And how soon shall I see you again? Yeah, on fera la navette, as we say. That is, I shall be hawking my turnips one about. And who knows? It's possible, just possible, that the turnip trade will bring me again to London. Tu feras la navette. I thought I'd heard a car. Yes, it's for me. I must go now. Come on, Navette! Tu feras la navette! into the water to do the washing. What are you washing, Mummy? Your socks. Oh, well, yes, Basil, I can only use a very few flakes because I have to leave enough for Auntie Louisa and this water is as hard as nails. What does hard as nails mean? You'll never guess who's turned up now. Not in a thousand, thousand years. Hitler. No, your mother, Auntie Bolter. She's just walked up the drive and walked in. Alone? No, with a man. Let me see, her current husband's a major something or the other. Oh, I he think. doesn't look like a major. He's got a musical instrument with him and he's very dirty. Oh, come on, Fanny, leave those to soap. So there we were, darlings, stuck on the Riviera with the Germans already in Bordeaux and nobody giving a hoot what happened to us. So then, Mervyn. Oh, that's the filthy beast I was married to. Mother! Fanny! Hello, uh. darling. Oh, and this must be Basil, I suppose. Hello, Basil, darling. <laughs> now, let's have a look at you, Fanny. Ooh, that's a nasty spot you've got in your nose. Make a seat to it, Emily. You brought her up. Now, where was I? On the Riviera with your filthy husband, Mervyn. That's it, darling. Thank you. So then the foul brute decided to stay behind and collaborate with the Huns. Oh, he always was a bit Hunnish, you know. So I managed to make a break for it over the mountains to Spain. What the hell's going on, Davy? You're supposed to be drilling your platoon. The Bolter, Matthew. Bo Matthew. Darling. Bolter. Oh. Who's this sewer with the violin? Now, if you brought that with you... Matthew, be quiet. The Bolter's in the middle of telling us all her thrilling adventures. I'm sure she can explain everything. Oh, yes, indeed. You see, when I got to Spain, they popped me in this ghastly prison camp. And if it hadn't been for my heavenly Juan here... Oh. He doesn't speak a word of English, by the way. Well, if it hadn't been for him, Matthew, I would still be sitting there now. But as it was, he helped me to escape. We had to converse entirely in signs, darlings. And he indicated to me that I should entice one of the guards. It's really too shame-making. 
flaunting round the sentry box, and then my lovely brave Juan hit him on the head while he was being... <coughs> well, enticed. And then we managed to get away to Barcelona, with me pretending to be a tart and Juan my pimp. Oh, and at last we got the British consul to help, because guess what? He was a second cousin of my last husband, but two. Then we sailed home, taking ten weeks in a tub like Noah's Ark and dossing down when it was our turn in the steerage lavatories. Well, Bolton, I'm delighted to see you, and I hope you'll stay as long as you like. But, Bolter, but... Matthew, now think of all he did for her. I am thinking. We must let him stay. Please, Matthew, darling, just for one little weekie. Oh, all right then. Just for one little week. Only for a few days. And this is not, definitely not, the thin end of the wedge. <laughs> as fine a seat as ever, my lady. Oh, Josh. Oh, you really mustn't call me my lady. I haven't been for ages, you know. Yes, my lady. Oh, no, Josh, you really mustn't say that. Fanny, oh, Fanny, help me to explain, Fanny. The thing is, Josh, I have had four husbands since Lord Logan, Miss Francis's father. I mean, Mrs. Winsham's father. Now, four husbands, Josh. Is it only three, Fanny? You know, I am never quite sure whether my marriage to that disgusting major was valid. There was something awfully fishy about those papers. Oh. Well, in that case... Perhaps I'm still married to my lovely, lovely Hank. The big game hunter. Oh, yes, darling. But of course, I can't still be married to him. I shot him in the head by accident. Silly me. I was a safari one day. But I suppose I could still be his relict. Now, that would mean that I could call myself Mrs. Rawl rather than Mrs. Plug, which is what I call myself today. Hmm. Which do you think sounds better, Josh? Mrs. Rawl or Mrs. Plug? Really not my place to advise you, my lady. <laughs> this little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed at home. This little piggy had roast beef. This little piggy had none. And this little piggy was a bold little piggy. And he went me, 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 all the way home. And as for <laughs> this little piggy... <laughs> She's a great hand with the children. It's funny, she only ever had me of her own, and I was looked after by a squadron of nannies. For the few months she actually stayed with me before the first bolt. Well, mine all adore her, and I propose positively to exploit the fact. But of course, we must be a little careful, Fanny. Juan, you know, he rushes into her room before tea and lives with her before tea. <laughs> well, it wouldn't do at all if any of the children caught them. David and Basil are safe in bed, darling, sleeping like seraphs. Juan gave them a little tune to send them off. Ah, I want a word with you about that. This, um, Guan. What's to be done about him? Well, Matthew, darling, Juan did save my life time and time again, you know. I can't very well tear him up now and throw him away now, can I, my sweet? Uh, point taken, Bolter, but I can't keep a lot of dagos here, you know. Oh, but do keep him just a little longer, Matthew, darling, please. Just for a few more days. And then I swear I will find some place for him and Tiny Me to go. You can't think what a lousy time we had together. I must stick to him now. I simply must. Oh, well, another week, if you like. <laughs> and after that, I'm afraid he must go. Sadie, I'm going to do an unpardonable thing. It is for the general good and for your good too, but it is unpardonable. David, what can be coming? It's the food, Sadie, the food. I know how difficult it is for you in wartime, but all of us in turns are being poisoned. I was sick for hours on end last night. 
the night before Emily had diarrhoea. Fanny still has that enormous spot on her nose. And the fact is, dear, that if Mrs Beecher were a Borgia, she couldn't be more successful. I know she's an awful cook. They were very lucky to have her. But what can one do, Davy? The meat ration only lasts two days. We have 14 meals a week. Well, and then what about game? There used to be such a lot here. The trouble is that Matthew thinks that all ammunition, even cartridges, must be kept for the Germans. So he refuses to waste even one ball of shot on hares and partridges. But you're quite right, Davy. The food is unwholesome. I'll try and do something about it. Come on, Davy! Stop stuffing yourself like a capon. Time for the night exercises. And remember, full fuel service marching order. Matthew! He's worse than all the torturers of the whole Spanish Inquisition! Those bottles. Davy's vitamin pills. I have to take all of these, Sadie, because in spite of what I said, the food is still so awful. Unless I took these, I might peter out altogether. And another thing, Boater. Hmm? You've been at my florist essence of geranium again. Only a tiny droppy, Davy, darling. A tiny droppy doesn't stink out the whole bathroom. You've been pouring it into the bath with the stopper out. That's my quota for the whole of the month. It really is heinous of you, Boater. I'll get you some more, darling. I swear, look, I'm going to London next week to have my wiggy wash and I'll bring you back a whole bottle. I promise, darling. And I very much hope you'll take Gowan with you and leave him there. <laughs> While the boat is in London, now's your time to talk to him. Why me? Because you're so clever, darling. Look at him, poor fellow. He hasn't even got the spirit to play his guitar anymore. Oh, we obviously can't turn him out to starve. I mean, one does have human feelings. Not towards Dagos. But we can get him a job. But first we must find out what his profession was. Now, you're so good at languages, Davy, and you're so worldly and resourceful. I'm sure if you had a look at the Spanish dictionary in the library, you could manage to ask him what he did before the war. Do try, Davy. Oh, yes, darling, do. Oh, all right, I'll try. Well, I can guess what the answer will be. G for gigolo. Not M for matador, or H for hidalgo. Even more useless. What then? Then B for B off, and the bolter will have to support him. Library, you say, the Spanish dictionary? West Wall, fifth shelf down, halfway along. My dears, it's too fantastic. You'll never, never guess. Davy, to have found out what my precious Juan is good at. Only one thing I thought, silly me. A cardinal chef. Mm, oh, Spanish that. food. So delicious, so unconstipating, so digestible, mm, so full of glorious garlic. Succulent birds, beasts, crustaceans at every meal. 
vegetables simply running with extravagant sauces. I only hope the food won't be too rich for you now, David. Oh, I never mind the rich food. It's the poor food that does one such an infinity of harm. Who? and then there's his talent for organising. Have you seen the storeroom that he's built up, Matthew? I go and gaze at it in sheer wonderment for hours on end. Mm -hmm. and preserves from morning till night. Shoots fowl with a kettlebell. Makes the most inspired that is from what we leave over. And so everyone's happy and healthy again. My spot that I had on my nose has completely vanished. And now even Uncle Matthew's taken one to his heart. <laughs> I'm afraid it happens all the time. She's that poorly. Can't you take her back to the country with you? She simply wouldn't budge. She's as obstinate as a donkey, madam. It ain't hardly right. She should sleep here all alone with the bombs and everything. But she won't listen to sense. I'd better let you have my telephone number where I live in the country, just in case. Right you are, madam. Are you all right, madam? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Have you guessed? I'm in the family way. That's what it is. Darling, you're not supposed to have another. Remember what the doctor said when Moira was born? Oh, doctors don't know anything. Of course I can. And I'm simply longing for it. This one won't be in the least like Moira, you'll see. I'm going to have another one, too. <laughs> How lovely when? Around the beginning of May. Me too. Oh, good. And Louisa's due at much the same time. Haven't we been busy? I do call that nice. They can all be Hons together. Now, Linda, why don't you come back with me to Alconley? There's no sense in stopping here in all this. It can't be good for you or the baby. I like it. It's my home and I like to be in it. Besides, someone might turn up just for a few hours, you see, and he knows where to find me here. You'll be killed and then he won't know where to find you. Oh, darling Fanny, don't be so silly. Nobody gets killed in air raids. There's a great deal of noise and mess, but people don't really get killed much. Oh, don't, darling, please don't. Touch wood. on the telephone from London. Linda's house has been hit. It is Linda. They don't know. They're still digging. Thank 
got for Uncle Matthew's home guard petrol. See? What did I tell you, Fanny, about air raids not killing people? My bed simply went straight through two floors into the basement, rather like a lift. Nothing wrong. Mild shock. She'll be all right, Najif. Then you can take her off in your car. You do realize she was pregnant? Yes. She still is. No damage, though. Pity. The child could kill her, even though the Germans haven't. Well, at least there can't be any more of this nonsense about staying in London. So, now you know it all, down to the teeniest little thing. You see, I wanted him to find me there, in the house that was given to me for love. Well, no one will find you there anymore. He'll come on here when he comes. He knows all about alchemy, and all of you. I've told him the histoire. That's what he calls it all, histoire. I've told him... Oh, so many times. And meanwhile, how are you going to explain the baby? <laughs> I don't have to. Or well, not yet. Mummy and Far have assumed, without being lied to, just assumed, that it's Christians. They think we've more or less been together all this time, you see. Or at any rate, whenever Christian could get any leave. Far oh, thinks no end of Christian now he's an officer. And in his old regiment at that. <laughs> the whirligig of time. seem rather unfair. Linda goes off and has this glorious time in Paris and comes back covered in rich furs. And what do we get for sticking all our lives to the same dreary old husbands? Three-quarter length Sean Lamb. Alfred isn't a dreary old husband. Nor is John. But you know what I mean. Yes, I know what you mean. No. Oh, now, Linda. That's is that one of the ones you got in Paris, you know, when you were doing your war work? Oh, it's wonderful what one can get there with no money, if you're clever. <laughs> yes, wonderful, isn't it, Linda, darling? Just been doing the pillboxes. I reckon we should be able to stop them for two hours, possibly three, before we're all killed. Not bad for such a little place. Cheer up, Missy. You won't know you're dead. And better dead than being raped by the Hun. Could be two points of view about that. Mother, you must stop all this with Linda. All about telling, you know. All this giggling and winking, this let's face it, we're just two fallen women approach. She simply can't bear it. But darling, she really is nothing but a high-class tart. In that flat in Paris. All those clothes. It was Softer, wasn't it? How did you know? Oh, everybody knew in the Riviera. One always knew about Softer somehow. Oh, and a jolly good cop for Linda, too, darling. You mustn't think I grudge. But, Mother, you must understand that she regards it all with the most intense feelings of romance. All those months she spent with Fabrice. He was, he is, the great love of her life. But I still don't see why she has to be so high hat about it. I mean, Sadie and Lachter, though I realise that, and wild horses wouldn't make me tell them I'm not that kind of a girl. I know. But I still think that when we're all together, Linda might be a teensy bit more jolly and less high hat. So I'm afraid, darling, that the Bolter's feelings have been rather coarsened by time. No good expecting sensitivity in that quarter. 
Oh, well, I'll just have to steer clear of her, I suppose. The reason I can't bear her way of carrying on is just because I might have been her. Just like her, I mean. A bolter myself. I almost thought I was until Fabrice. Well, at least she does realise that Fabrice has got to be kept from Uncle Matthew and Aunt Sadie. She won't let you down there. I sometimes think I shall let myself down. It's such a strain making up things I'm supposed to have heard from Christian. You know, how he hates his CO or adores Cairo. And, of course, I never hear anything from him at all. But don't they notice it? You never get any letters? No. I do this act of always being the first down to grab mine off the mat. You know, so eager for news I can hardly wait. But, of course, it isn't an act. It's quite true. I am eager. I'm consumed to hear from Fabrice. Oh, if only there could be just one line. Do you ever think about your husbands? Well, funnily enough, I do quite often think about Tony. And I see that the thing going wrong was hardly his fault. I don't think it would have gone right with anyone. Unless I'd happened to meet Fabrice then. Because in those days, I was so extremely nasty. And Christian? Oh, he was just an interlude. He hardly counts in my life at all. Because our marriage only lasted such a very short time and was quite overshadowed by what came after. And what do you think is to come? One day the telephone will ring, as it did once before. And he'll be there. O oh Lord, we give thee hearty thanks that one has catapulted yet another pheasant and that the storeroom continues to be crammed with abundance. Oh, yes. Yes. yes, that's just the thing. Oh, yes, what's the thing? The storeroom, Aladdin's cave, as we call it. Eh? When the invasion comes, there's a very important job to be done. And I'm making you officer responsible, Davy. Responsible for what? Blowing up Aladdin's cave. But why, Matthew? Why? When the Germans come... And we're all dead. That cupboard could keep them going for weeks. All wrong. Make them gum up their lines of communication by having to bring up their own food. But Matthew, darling, some of us may still be alive. Then you'll deserve to starve. Oh. Or live off the scraps the Huns give you. I would have let old Guan blow it up. to store him, after all. But the fact is, although I rather like old Guan these days, I don't altogether trust the fella. Once a foreigner, always a foreigner, in my opinion. So, Debbie, I'll show you how to do it after luncheon. Senor. Oh. <sighs> do you mind? <clears throat> I thought I'd pop in to work up a little circulation. Really, it's too bad of Matthew to insist on blowing up Aladdin when the Germans come. Invasion or no invasion, I shall not be able to find it in my soul to blow up Aladdin. And Emily entirely agrees with me. I think Far's right. Well, it's all very well for you, Linda. You'll get fed somehow, pregnant women always are. <laughs> but nobody will bother about me. And I shall never be able to make the Germans understand about my delicate stomach. Davy, if you won't go and blow up Aladdin, I shall go to Far for lessons how to do it tomorrow. I shall just have to resign myself to a lingering death. Not a very pleasant prospect, I must say. Far's plan is simply ridiculous. And it's typical of Linda's sheer fecklessness to support it. She takes no thought for the future, for any aspect of it. I've tried to jolt her. But she simply says, one day the telephone will ring, as if she were saying, one day my prince will come. Whatever will a baby wear, poor thing? If ever a baby came naked into this world, it'll certainly be this one. And what on earth Christian have to say when he hears about it? They are still married. He'll have to bring a suit to illegitimise it, and then the scandal will be quite infinite. I quite think Far will turn her out into the snow. Much as he loves her. He's simply Victorian about all this kind of thing. Oh, she ought to be beside herself with worry. Instead of which, she's behaving like the wife of a millionaire in Monte Carlo. Nevertheless, as her time is very near, I shall positively go to Oxford and buy her a layette myself. But it's rather sad to belong to a lost generation as we do. I'm sure history will squeeze the two wars together and they'll count as one. And people will forget we ever existed. We might just as well have never lived at all. 
It is unfair. This is for you. Oh, Louisa Fanny, thank you. How sweet of you. It's all Louisa's doing. I've no energy for Oxford or shopping now. I'm due the same time as you remember. So's Louisa. Thank you, Louisa. You're... you're a real hon. Well, it wasn't all that much bother. After all, I've had more practice at this kind of thing than you two. <laughs> but times are hard, and I'd like to be paid. When you can, of course. Tony's engagement ring. You ought to get a bid for it. Done? Done. Oh, Fanny! Oh, Fanny, are you all right? <sighs> Fanny, darling. Oh, Fanny! <sighs> Now, here's a telegram from Alfred in Alexandria. And uh, Merlin sends his love, his best love, he said, and a million congratulations. Oh, and you'll be delighted to hear that Louisa has had a boy. Angus, they're going to call him. <laughs> Sadie sends love. She says you're to take it very easily after the beastly time you've had and not to dream of coming back until you're quite well. But who will manage the boys? Oh, the boater and Emily are doing a spectacular job between them. <laughs> the boater's turned up absolute trumps. Her turn to come and see you tomorrow. And Aunt Sadie, I do long to see her. Well, Sadie can't come just now, darling. She has to stay at Alchemy. Oh, I suppose she's busy looking after Linda. I know Louisa and I were pretty early, but Linda must be due at absolutely any moment. Linda is dead, Fanny. She had a fine... Sh son. But she is dead. The doctors were right. Funny how few things she had. These lovely dresses she got in Paris when she was on her war work, and that sable coat, and then nothing. Most of her stuff was destroyed when Cheney Walk was bombed. But there must have been letters and things. What happened to all those letters and Christians she was always telling us about? Dispatch rider? I shouldn't wonder if the balloon hasn't gone up at last. Darling Matthew must be the last man in England who still believes there may be an invasion. Hmm. Well, don't disillusion him, Duck. He needs something enjoyable to think about just now. A frog of all things! From De Gaulle's HQ in London. With a message for... Belinda. The devil can all this be about? I think you'd better let Aunt Sadie open it. Cher madame, je suis chargée... Not in English, perhaps. Uh, dear madame, I'm instructed to inform you with the deepest regret that Major General, that Major General, the Duke of Sauveterre. Duke of Sauveterre? Who's he? Has been killed while on active service. Why this to Linda? Listen to me, darlings. I hope to God I can make you understand. Oh, no, no, children. Sandwiches first. Oh, it's a lovely christening. Two little boys. Thank you. If only Belinda's was Christian, as it should have been. You must forgive her that. Oh, I do. One always forgave her anything in the end. But I could just wish... That... Wish what? The Sauveterre fellow may have been a frog, but he was a soldier and a gentleman. And from all I've heard, he died like one, too. A proper father for any woman's child. So there's an end to that. 
I heard all about it through free French liaison. Mm -hmm. Sauvete was running the resistance over a large area beneath the Pyrenees. He was betrayed to the Gestapo, captured and shot. Who betrayed him? I can make a goodish guess. A successful leader with the name Duke de Sauveterre will be gall and wormwood to at least one political faction in the resistance. Well, whoever betrayed Fabrice Sauveterre may have made a hero of him. So they weren't quite as clever as they thought. Ah. Sauveterre's class will need a few heroes when this war is done. I have decided. If Juan will come and cook for me at Merlinford Bolter, I will even put up with you in the house. This war has finally destroyed whatever conscience I had left. <laughs> Treble the money. Did you understand that one, darling? His English has got much better, you know. Yes, yes, I have understood it. My lord, Juan serves whom it pleases him to serve. And it pleases him very much to serve the Lady of Alchemy, who took him in when uh, things were very low, you see. Oh. Pity yours couldn't be christened with the other two. We must wait until his father can get leave. Where exactly is John now? I don't know, I'm sure. All madly secret. Like Linda's Duke. Not nearly as dangerous, thank God. I once met Linda's Duke. A long time ago. He was a favourite of Mummy's and she asked him to Hampton. Fanny was there too, I remember, and simply adored him. I think he was the most attractive man I ever met. Not beautiful. Not even handsome. But somehow... magical. Come and look at the table. <laughs> Since both Linda and Fabrice are dead, I have adopted the little Fabrice, with the consent of Christian, the legal father. He has blue eyes, the same shape as Linda's brown ones, and is a most beautiful and enchanting child. I love him quite as much as, and perhaps more than, I do my own. Penny for them, Fanny, darling. I was thinking about Linda. Ah, yes, Linda. Poor Linda. Poor little girl. You know, Fanny, perhaps it's for the best, after all. I mean, the lives of women like Linda and me are not quite so much fun as one begins to get older. Well, I think she would have been happy with Fabrice. He was the great love of her life, you know. <laughs> oh, darling. One always thinks that. Every, every time. <laughs> 